Good afternoon, Saints. Welcome to uh, Sunday Bible study. What we do here, we teach about things that you ought to do according to the Word of God. And what we do is give you the scripture for it, uh, a little bit of, you know, comments on it, or testifying, you know, how it's worked in our lives. And what we do is set it before you so that you can make a choice. Because the, the ultimate thing that you have to do in your life is make a choice whether you're going to be on God's side or not. That, that's what you have to make a choice of. And what we do, we set before you a lot of scriptures. Mm -hmm. Now, what I've been teaching, Lord, is uh, the modern church is subject to Christ and nobody else. That's all. That's who we're subject to is Christ. Amen. We all have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> Give account for what we did in this body. So if you're in the church, you're subject to Christ. Now, if you're not in the church, we always give you the opportunity to, uh, you know, to come into church to be born again, or, you know, if you don't want to become a, you know, a follower of us, you can be born again and go out there and find your own Bible teaching church. Because there's a lot of churches out there teaching the same thing that we're teaching. We're just one part of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ has many parts. And they're all here on this earth to edify you and build you up in your faith. Because see, it takes faith in his word to believe what he's saying is true. You have to have faith in God. And you have to believe that Jesus, the Son of God, who is the Christ, is the only way to get to God the Father. There's no other way. And so many people are confused about this. They think that there's all kinds of ways to get to God, but truthfully, there's only one way to get to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. Um, let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for all your goodness. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who has died for our sins and was buried and rose the third day. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that you have given us. We pray that you will lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit on what we're supposed to do here today and say. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. The scripture we're starting at today is 2 Corinthians 11th chapter, and we're going to be going back into that 11th chapter again, but I want to start at 2 Corinthians 11, 3, which says, But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. This is what the devil does. He makes you think what God said, just like he had told Eve that God said this, and that he wants you, he says the same thing to you today that God say this. We all have our holy scriptures. I mean, there's different translations. I use the New King James, but there are other translations out there which are good. But all the translations are not the Word of God. Some translations are paraphrases. What do you mean? Paraphrases is when somebody writes down something, what they think, what God is saying. I don't need that. Tell me what God is saying, because I have the Holy Spirit inside of me to interpret that, what God is saying, right? Mm -hmm. We have the Holy Spirit. Our spirit bears witness that with his spirit that we are a child of God. 
we don't need nobody to interpret the scriptures to us. And that's why we just give you the scriptures the way it is and leave it as that. And like he's saying here, just like he was deceived, he don't want our minds to be corrupted from the simplicity of what is in Christ. That means what is simple, what is in Christ. What's simple is Jesus is the only way to get to God. That's simple, right? And if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that God has raised him from the dead, which we're going to be celebrating next week, Resurrection Sunday, you're saved. Amen? Amen. That's simple. Now jump down to me, with me, to the 13th verse of that same book, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. Here's where the problem comes in. He says, uh, Paul writes, because what Paul was doing over here in 2 uh, uh, Corinthians, what he was talking about is uh, false apostles. And he starts in the 13th verse, he says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. I imagine that's how he appeared to Eve in the garden. He, did, he wasn't a serpent what we can imagine in our mind, crying, you know, like the serpent's weak. You know, the, you know what our mind perceives the serpent is? He wasn't like that. I, I believe that he actually transferred transformed himself into an angel of light. Or why would she be talking to him? He had to look good, right? Right. He wasn't a man on the ground. Right. That was his punishment. For man right. The and ground. then it says uh, in the 15th verse, Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So, Satan has some ministers working with him. And we find a lot of these ministers are working in these different denominations. Amen? Now, we, last time I taught you, I, I, I took you to Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the 22nd verse. It says, wives, submit to your husband, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So that, that makes it plain and simple, right? But where we run into the problem in the modern church is a lot of women do not want to submit to their own husband. They don't want to respect their husband. If they're not happy, they're out of here. No fault divorce. Now, First Timothy, the second chapter, the 14th verse says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now, can you give me some scripture here out of Amplified that really... Wait, where did you say the... Second Timothy, the second chapter. I, I think the saints need to hear this out of the Amplified. Which verse? Uh, read verses 8 through 15 because it's talking about uh, men and women in the church. That's what it's actually talking about. It I says, would... Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and disputing and quarreling or doubt in their mind. Likewise, I want women to adore themselves modestly, appropriately, 
and discreetly in a proper clothing, not with elaborate, elaborate braided hair and gold and pearls and expensive clothes, but instead adored by good deeds, helping others as is proper for women who profess to worship God. A woman must quietly receive instruction with all submissiveness. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet in the congregation. For Adam was formed first by God from the earth, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman who was led astray and fell into sin. But women will be preserved safe through the pain and danger, dangers of bearing children, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control and discretion. Now, when you look at them two passages, the one in Ephesians and the one in First Timothy, the second chapter, it it gives you the impression that the woman was deceived and not Adam. But I know that Adam had just as much to do with this as Eve did. Because God told Adam what to tell Eve, right? Right. So where does the problem come in with the modern church with uh, the man being in his place and the woman being in her place, and um, you know the woman nesting, the home raising the children. That's that's what the woman's job is: is to raise the children, to teach them the word of God, and to bring them up in the fear of the God. Now, where the problem is in the modern church is we have false apostles. What do you mean? Go with me to 1 Peter, the fifth chapter. Because it, it breaks it down in a way that you can comprehend it. And plus, you can go back and you can read it yourself and you can research it. You can cross reference it and you don't know, do whatever you need to do with it. Because there's software out there on the internet that you can cross reference any scripture and you don't do all kinds of things with it to get the, the explanation for what you're looking for. Now, of what we have done a lot of times, we have started to believe something that we heard, and then we look into scriptures to try to make the scriptures say what we believe. But the, the correct way for this to happen is that you believe what God is saying in his scriptures and then you change your life. Right? You change your life. You repent. When you hear something in the scriptures that you may have been believing that you thought was right, you change your way of living and start living the way the Bible says. That's the way you start believing what the Bible is saying. All them thoughts and imaginations you had in your hand, you cast them out. Amen? Yeah. And you start saying, I'm going to believe what the Word of God says. What you do, you put the Word of God first in your life. Now, 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, it says, The elders who are among you, I extort, I am a fellow el elders and a witness of the suffering of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. So Peter is speaking as an elder. If you do any church history, if you study the history of the church, a lot of um, theologians and scholars believe that Peter was the first pope of the church. Now it says in the second verse, shepherd the flock, of God, which is among you, 
serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willing. That means, that word compulsion means that uh, you have made it up in your heart. You have purposed in your heart that you're going to be a shepherd. Amen? That God has called you to do. And you're going to be serving as an overseer. Willing. And it says, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. That's where our elders go off at. Dishonest gain. What is dishonest gain? For the money. They are saying things they ought to not be saying or teaching or preaching because of the money. Amen? And it says here, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. We run into this in church, there's a hierarchy. That whoever's the pastor or whatever he's calling himself, a bishop or whatever, we're supposed to bow down to him. But here's where a lot of our elders and stuff go off at, and shepherds or whatever you're calling yourself is, that you are a man, just like me. I, I'm an elder. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And I know no other man is no different from me. We both you know, are similar. We both have similar characteristics as a man. Amen? Amen. But what makes some uh, elders different than others, one elder is going to tell you the truth about the Word of God. Amen. You know, these, these scriptures that I wrote, uh, read to you, those are some hard scriptures to read to your congregation. To let your congregation know that uh, this is what the order of God says. Amen? Mm -hmm. And what Peter's saying down here, that you're not uh, supposed to be lords over those entrusted to you. You're not supposed to lord over your people. You're supposed to be an example. Amen? And we find this way too much that uh, mm -hmm. people get so lifted up that they forget that they're just a man. Amen? Amen. But you know the way I look at it, any pastor, bishop, or whoever he's calling himself, a pope or whatever, you're a man just like me. I think the pope just came out of hospital. It's supposed to be serving the will of God, not for the, what they want. Right. Now let's read this fifth verse. I mean, fourth verse. It says, "And when the chief shepherd appears, he will, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away." And then it says, "Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders." Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. And be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So that, that pretty well breaks it down. If you got pride in your life, if you're over a denomination and you, you're so puffed up and prideful that nobody can tell you anything, because we all of us, we, all of us don't know everything. We only know in part. You can't be over a congregation and not be willing to communicate with your people. Because it may be somebody in there sees something that you don't see, right? And then it says, Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. And then it says, Be sober. Be diligent, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, 
seeking whom he may devour. This is what's going on in our modern church. The devil is up in there devouring people. And he started with the leadership. Amen. Well, how do you know he started with the leadership? Go, go with me to John, the eighth chapter. Because when Jesus was on earth, he was constantly telling the leadership what they should, you know, what, what his father told him to tell them. And a lot of what Jesus was telling the leadership, you know, the, the priests and the elders and all that, they wasn't in agreement with that. They wasn't, you know, scribes, Pharisees, none of them were in agreement with what Jesus was uh, saying and doing. Now in John, the 8th chapter, verse uh, 44, it says, this is what Jesus told them. This is bold. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. This is why the modern church is all out of order, toe up. This is why a lot of people, you know, they don't want to go to church because they say, well, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. But, you know, the whole thing about going to church, you don't go to church to be seeing what everybody else is doing. You go to church to worship God and to hear the word of God. Now, if they're not preaching the word of God, you're in the wrong church, right? And you need to get on up out of here and get into a Bible teaching church. There are a lot of Bible teaching churches. Uh, every church is not corrupt. But there, I could, might say that the majority of them are, not all, but some, you know, right? Because we're been in some of these churches. Now, go with me to uh, Matthew 26, because Jesus, all the way through the gospel, gives us examples of different stuff. And see, the more you know, the more it's going to help you, because it's up to us as elders and pastors and shepherds, or whatever you're calling yourself, to give, feed the flock of God, the Word of God, right? Amen. So they can make, start making choices in their life and get on the right path. Because God has a plan for them. And they must know that in their denomination, the devil is right up in there with them. A lot of times the devil is the one up in there before anybody else gets up in there. Amen? Amen. Because he wants to set up his traps. Now in Matthew, the 26th chapter, we see the plot to kill Jesus. You mean there was a plot to kill Jesus? Yes, there was a plot to kill Jesus. Amen? And it tells us... Uh, in the third verse it says, Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Capitalist. You see, you see how that all plays in there? Amen. This is not something new. When they have a church meeting, they before they have a church meeting, they have a business meeting their self on how they going to, you know, tell this lie. Amen? But in the first verse it says, let's get it into contents, where, it, where this came from. It says in the first verse, Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these things, that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. 
Then the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, whose name is Catholic, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. See, the devil has a plan all the time. What is his plan? He is out here seeking whom he may devour. He walks about like a roaring lion seeking who he might devour. And then we see in the sixth verse, this is what kicked it off that we don't talk about enough, I don't think. In the sixth verse, this is the anointing at Bethany. It says, when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman called to him saying, called to him having an alabaster flask, a very costly fragment oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Now, when, when somebody says that to you, that, you know, why did you spend all that money on your suit or your outfit or your car or your house or your furniture, you could have took that money and given it to the poor. That's the devil talking to you because we find out, you know, on through this that it was Judas who was saying that because he had the purse and he was taking money out of the purse. Amen. And then it says, but when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, why do you trouble this woman? Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragment oil on my body, she did it for my burial. But surely I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as in remorse. We don't talk about that when we're preaching the gospel. Amen? Mm -hmm. This should be talked about her act of love and devotion. Now, here's where the money meets the road. I mean, the rubber hits the road. Where the rubber, where I said the money hits the road. Well, it's all about money, too. You don't see what I'm talking about. This is when Judas agrees to betray Jesus. In verse 14, it says, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver. So, from that time, he saw opportunity to betray him. This is where all this uh, corruption comes in the church. It's all about money. A big part of the modern church is about money. Well, why do you say that? Because the church has always been a business. I remember this one pastor told me that um, the, the church for the black man is the biggest business that he probably will ever have. Amen? They don't look at the church as, you know, teaching you what's right and what's wrong and leading you to Jesus Christ and, you know, giving you things that can uh, build you up and edify you and, you know, telling you how you ought to be walking in love and not have all this bitterness and jealousy and hate and anger and unforgiveness in your life, which all them things can make you sick. Because your body is not set up for any kind of stress to be on it. What we're set up, we're a three-part person. We are a spirit. We are a spirit. You are a spirit. 
we possess a soul and we live in this body. And anytime you're running around here with unforgiveness and bitterness and hate and jealousy and envy and all that in your life, and you haven't repented, what you have done is put stress on the spiritual part of your body. You're, you're quenching the Holy Spirit. You're quenching your spirit. And what's happening to your body is suffering from it. And it's the love of God and the love for one another and forgiveness for one another is what keeps you healthy, well, and prosperous. Amen. Your life comes from the Spirit. Amen. The love of God. Now, continuing on here, if you jump down to the 25th verse of that chapter, it says, Then Judas who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you have said. Well, let's go back on up here to the 17th verse. Because, see, we'd like to give you a verse, you know, because this is all about the leadership in the church. Jesus was an apostle. Right. Chosen by Jesus. Right. He had power to cast out devils. He went and preached the gospel. You know, he, he was one of them 12 that he sent out. Amen? It says in the 17th verse, Now on the first day of the feast on the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city, a certain man, and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples came. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. These are the twelve there. The twelve apostles. This is the board of the church. Amen? As they were eating, he said, Assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Mm. And they were a seeding sulfur, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? All of them, you know, were like, whew, I hope it ain't me. Amen. <laughs> he answered and said, he who dips his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said to him, You have said it. Now, we need to stop right there. Because that's a whole lot to unpack. But here's the, the bottom line to what I'm going to give you today. He, he asked them, is it I? Right? That's Judas asking him, is it I? And just like all the rest of them, is it, am I, is it I? But what we need to be saying in the modern church today, I am the one. Amen? What do you mean I am the one? I'm the one that's been deceiving my denomination. Amen? I'm the one that God told me to preach the word in season and out of season, and I have not been. I'm the one that's been stealing money from the church. 
I'm the one that wants everybody to stand up and worship me instead of Jesus. I'm the one that wants to wear all these nice suits and clothes. I'm, I'm the one who wants this fancy car. I'm the one who wants to fly in jet planes. I'm the one that has betrayed my Lord. See, it ain't always the woman's fault. It's the man's fault. Because we are the one that God put right behind Christ. Right, man? Right? Mm -hmm. Christ is the head of man. That's right. And we're supposed to be walking as we ought to walk. And what man has done is he's out of order. And bless some of these women's hearts. They're, they're trying to, you know, talk to these different men and tell them that you shouldn't be doing that, you shouldn't be doing that. And then what he does, he throws that verse on them in, you know, first Timothy, the second chapter, that you, you need to be quiet. You shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't be talking. But let me tell you something. As soon as man gets in order, the women will be in order to. Well, why? Why are you saying that? Because I'm saying it as a man. I know until in my own house, until I got my act in order, my house was out of order. I know that the different denominations I was in, until I got my act in order, I was the one out of order. I was the one thinking that I should be teaching and preaching. I was the one that, that thought that I should be saying different things that I ought not to be saying. Amen? See, you have to take accountability for yourself because you have to realize we as men, we know in part. We don't know everything. We just know in part. And see, this is where pastors and shepherds or bishops or whoever you want to call them fall short by saying that they know everything when they know they don't know everything. And then if any man approaches them and with some kind of uh, something that they say in the word of God that you may be slipping on, then that's when your pride and arrogance comes into play that you don't want to listen to them. You tell them, look, if you don't like it up in here, you can just get out. Mm -hmm. See, until, see, it's, it's easy for a pastor or somebody to talk to a man like that in church because they can probably get away with it. Mm -hmm. But if you try to talk to a man like that on the street, you won't get away with it. No. Because... That's disrespect. I'm a man just like you. You're supposed to uh, respect me as a man just like I'm respecting you as a man. You're not supposed to be telling me if I don't like it, you can just get out. And that you got the wrong demeanor. You got the wrong spirit. Right. No, it's you that's full of the devil. Right. It's you that got the wrong spirit. It's you that got the wrong demeanor. You know, this is, I, I believe as Judas had said, I'm the one, Lord, who betrayed you. That he probably would have got forgiven and the whole New Testament would have been rewritten a whole different way. Because Peter denied him three times. Even though he said he wouldn't. That's all in this chapter. He denied him three times. And the Lord forgave him. But one thing the Lord said, the Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Amen. It would have been yeah. good that for that man if he had not been born. Amen. Don't keep betraying the Lord because it won't end up nice. If somebody's coming to you, another man, and he's trying to tell you that what you're doing is out of order, you need to start listening. Yeah, listen. And stop, you know, getting all 
See, what it is, a lot of men in church are not men. Because real men will listen to men. Amen. Real men, uh, what they do, they uh, surround themselves with real men of their kind. And they have a network of real men that they work with and get things accomplished. If you're out there by yourself and you believe that you're doing right, and somebody comes to you and tells you that you're doing wrong, and you tell them that if you don't like it, you can just get out of here, you're the one out of order. Amen? So it's up to the shepherds to get in order. Jump to with me to uh, 1 Corinthians 11 chapter again. Because see, I can say this as a man, because I've been through this with these uh, pastors and, and bishops or whatever you want to call them. You know what I mean? When you tell them, but you know, it was one time, you know, I was in a business meeting and the deacons and the pastors were there and they were out of order and they said, well, what you going to do? You going to beat me up? I said, what I can do, I can take you all on one at a time. I can do that. If, if you, you know, want to come over here and get some of me, you know what I mean? And that shut them up. Because, you know, don't nobody like to be disrespected, especially a man. Right. Now, 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 27, verse says, Therefore, whenever you, whenever you eat this bread or drink this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of this bread and drink of this cup. Amen? Amen. So let's go, let's, let's, where did that come from? Why did Paul say that? Because what he was doing here in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he was uh, teaching on the institution of the Lord's Supper. He said in the 23rd verse, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, Take this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death to him till he comes. Therefore, whosoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner is guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of this bread and drink of this cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the, body, the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak, and sick among you, and many sleep. Didn't I tell you sin will get you in trouble? And you'll be sick. Of, what are you talking about sleep here? He's talking about death. For if we would judge ourselves, we will not be judged. That's what this whole message is about. For the elders and the shepherds and the pastors to start judging their self, so they don't be judged. Stop judging everybody else. Amen. And stop telling people things that tickle their ears because of the money. Amen. Tell them the truth, the truth. That if they do certain things, they can't inherit the kingdom of God or of Christ. They won't be going to heaven because it's sin. They need to know the consequences. They need to know this, yeah. that they can't keep doing certain things and especially if they're walking around in unforgiveness Amen. against their mate or their kids 
or whoever they got this unforgiveness against, that's putting them, that's almost signing their death certificate. But I'm here to tell you that God is merciful, God is love, God is good, and that's why you need to know that you need to forgive people. Amen. Just as Christ has forgiven you. This is what this is all about. Now it says here in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. <coughs> Test yourself. Do you not know yourself that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. Now, Galatians, the sixth chapter, tells us something. And we really need to get a handle on this in, in, in these different denominations. It says, Galatians 6, verse 1, Brother, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. This is where the, in the modern church, where, where the, the, hit, the leadership has gone astray. Because they think that they go really something. Right, and they're not. And they're nothing. Mm -hmm. some well, how do you know I'm deceived, brother? Because if you wouldn't deceive, you would know that you're not deceived. When you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived. And when somebody's trying to tell you that you need to straighten up and get right, you, you know, get on board. I mean, get on God's program and get off of your program or whoever's program you're on. Get back on God's program and plan to preach the word in season and out of season. That's what he's told you to do. And it says here, in the fourth verse, but let each one examine his own work. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. That's right. For each one shall bear his own load. Yeah. That means each one of us are going to be standing before the judgment seat of Christ, mm -hmm. the tribunal of Christ. And we're going to be judged for everything that we have done in this body. Y'all have a good holiday coming up, Easter. <laughs>